Hey there, and welcome to the second part of this tutorial where we will explore power systems in space engineers, looking at batteries, reactors, hydrogen engines, solar panels, and wind turbines. I will talk about each individually going through their pros and cons, then I will finish up with block and energy priority lists, as well as some tips and tricks for getting around some limitations. Electricity or power will be transmitted through any adjacent blocks on a grid regardless of whether or not the block has been completely welded. The only block that does not transmit power through it is the landing gear. If you land your gear on another grid, the power will not be shared. Power will be transmitted through mechanical blocks and subgrids too, so you can power a multitude of clang-inducing abominations. So, starting off with batteries. Batteries are a block that can recharge and discharge electricity on your grid, whether a large grid or a small grid. For a large grid, the battery block is one by one by one block, and for a small grid, you have two battery options. The smaller is a one by one by one, and the larger is a two by three by three. Batteries will pretty much be used on every grid where power is required because they can be recharged from either an onboard power supply such as reactors or hydrogen engines or from connecting another grid via a connector or a merge block. On screen you can see a table which details the maximum stored power and maximum output for each battery size. Though they may seem a bit useless, the small grid battery is actually great for filling in those little gaps on rovers and small aircraft where placing an armor block would just be a waste of space. When you build a battery, the battery comes with 30% charge, which is very nice. So with a new build of a ship or a rover, chucking a few batteries on there will make sure that your functional blocks will be working as intended. As with most power blocks, batteries require special components to build them, and that for the battery is the power cell. The downside is if you grind the battery down, the power cells will become scrap metal, so avoid grinding them down where possible, and try and cut around the block and then maneuver it into place with more merge blocks or another ship if you need to. When charging batteries, you lose 20% of the power that you put into them for arbitrary reasons. However, if you charge batteries with a reactor, you lose another 20% on top of that. So where possible, try to charge batteries with renewable sources to avoid wasting energy. And the pros of batteries include they're useful on any grid and reusable. And the cons are that you lose components when you grind them down and energy is lost when charging. Next up is reactor power. And this was the first energy source in space engineers and has remained pretty much unchanged since 2013. The reactor block works by generating power by consuming refined uranium. Reactors on a block to block basis produce by far the most amount of power with the large grid reactor being capable of 300 megawatts of output. For each grid size there are two reactor variants, so four altogether. Both small reactor variants are a 1x1x1 one by one by one, and both large variants are 3x3x3. Three by three by three. The special component required for these blocks is reactor components that requires gravel in order to be made. On screen you can see tabulated stats for the reactors where you can see that they are very powerful but unfortunately uranium can be very rare as it is only found on asteroids and sometimes in the aftermath of meteor impacts. If you stack large grid regular size reactors to occupy the same size as one large reactor you can produce more power. However, if you do this, your ship or grid will be much heavier and the PCU value will also skyrocket. This approach is only really viable on stations or in save games or servers with a high PCU count. One large reactor is 25 PCU, but 27 small reactors in the same space would use 675 PCU. If you don't play around with those limits though, then it doesn't matter, but you will need a large space to run that many reactors anyway because of all the conveyors you'll need. But overall, the large reactors are more economical to build when it comes down to mass and components. And a last point is that every reactor has the same uranium efficiency. So the pros of the reactor include it's just a very powerful energy source. And the cons include that uranium can be hard to find and it needs a refinery for the uranium and a conveyor network. But if you get into that point, those things will already exist. Next up we have hydrogen power. Hydrogen power is generated by burning hydrogen gas in an engine and hydrogen gas comes from running ice through an O2H2 generator. So you're going to need a decent amount of ice, some automated drilling and a conveyor network, but hydrogen engines are pretty powerful. On a large grid, the hydrogen engine is fueled by a large hydrogen tank will run for over 8 hours at maximum output of 5 megawatts. Here is a table showing the duration and power output of hydrogen engines for large and small grids. Fueling a small grid engine with small tanks will take a lot of tanks, so it's easier to use a larger tank. 
By all means though, like with small batteries, fit smaller tanks into gaps that don't have any function, though beware that conveyor blocks will be needed. As a note, to fill a large grid large hydrogen tank, you will need around 800,000 kilos of ice and it will take a long time to refine it with just one or two H2 generator. So the pros of hydrogen power are that it is a good energy source if you're in the right place because there will always be ice for days. And the cons is that it requires a thorough conveyor network with hydrogen tanks, or 2 h 2 generators, a miner, and a big source of ice. Also, it's very noisy. Though do be careful of using hydrogen power if you're also using hydrogen for your thrust on your ship because you don't want to be blasting through your H2 reserves without realizing and ended up being stranded in space, especially if you're already moving. On to renewable power sources starting with solar. Solar panels are available for both large and small grids with one for each size. They require solar cells to build and the panels themselves work on a set and forget type placement where once you've built them you shouldn't really need to adjust them. They do however require a direct line of sight with the sun that moves across the sky each day so obviously they won't work at night. But if you're in space, as long as you're pointing towards the sun in some way, you're fine. They have optimal production when they are perpendicular to the sun, so having the solar panels just horizontal or vertical, like I've got here, isn't very optimal. If you don't have access to scripts, then unfortunately you will have to make do unless you know some trickery. The lights on the bottom of the solar panel represent how much energy is being produced. When there are more green lights, the more energy you're getting. Also be aware not to occlude the panels with any form of shadows as this will reduce the efficiency of the panels. Now they don't provide masses of energy, so building one or two might not be worth it. Solar panels are useful as a supplemental power supply, as the grid will use power from solar panels first before reactors, engines and batteries. Here we have a script based solar tower which tracks the sun using ISI solar tracker with a link in the description. We have a tower with a rotor for azimuth and another rotor on its side for elevation, so throughout the day it will automatically track to see four green bars on every panel. And the pros of this include its renewable source and it's passive so it will just always generate power as long as the sun is there. And cons, obviously it won't work at night and it's a relatively small amount of power consumption for a fairly large block. The final source of power is another renewable source but it is a fairly large block and that is wind power. Wind turbine generators, not windmills, they're not milling anything, utilize the power of the atmosphere and pressure to generate power eternally. They work day and night, though they do require elevation to function optimally, where the higher the elevation, the better. Having more items within close proximity will also have a negative effect on productivity, so build them spaced out. Here I have a variety of wind turbines at different heights, and as I scroll between them, you can see that at higher altitude, the wind turbines generate more power. With a spacing of about 7 blocks here, this ensures that both these wind turbines produce over 400 megawatts each. You may want to build this kind of structure away from your main setup in case of attack or flying mishaps which could demolish it like I've got here. During inclement weather such as storms, the winds will be blowing harder and this means that wind turbines will also be producing more power which is an ideal time to put your batteries on recharge. Wind turbines are normally only used on static grids because they have to be connected to the ground, but in fact you can use wind turbines on a mobile grid just as long as you lock them to the ground without the use of a subgrid. Here you can see this massive rover and underneath there is a mag plate, so everything is just one solid grid. So if I park up and I bring up my wheels, The mag plate underneath is now locked to the ground and hey presto, the wind turbines start spinning which means I can park wherever I want, ideally on a hilltop, and charge the batteries. So the pros of wind power include that they work all day, they're cheap to build and they're a decent source of power production that doesn't need much upkeep. But the cons do include that they do only work on planets with a good atmosphere, obviously they're not going to work in space. In Space Engineers, there is a power block priority list as well as a consumption block priority list. These determine which power sources will be used first and which systems will be switched off first in case of low power. So firstly, I will go through the power block priority list. Solar and wind power sources will be used first on a grid if available as this will reduce the load on all of your other sources. Next to be used will be hydrogen engines, followed by reactors, and then finally batteries. For power consumption, blocks are grouped into categories and if you have low power, the groups will be disabled in the following order. Starting firstly, with any batteries that are charging will be stopped, then thrusters will be switched off, 
the gyroscopes will be disabled, then charging of jump drives will be stopped, and then utility mechanical blocks, then doors, then factory blocks such as assemblies and refineries, and then conveyors, and last but not least, your defense blocks, meaning that if you're on low power and under attack, the guns will still fire until all the power is used up. Finally, I'll overview my advice for what power sources to use for different grids. So for small grids, I suggest batteries and some solar if you can manage it for covering your flanks and a reactor if you have access to uranium. For large grids that are mobile, such as ships and mega rovers, batteries and hydrogen if you have ice, reactors if you have uranium and solar panels along your flanks if you have the space for them. And finally, for large static grids such as stations and bases, all of the above plus wind turbines, though you might want to use multiple small reactors rather than one large one, as the ratio is one large to 20 small. So that about wraps up part two of this tutorial series. Next time we'll look more in depth at mining and refining. So I want to thank you very much for watching and make sure to click the video on screen for part three and have a great day.